Hi, I'm Joe Saunders with Miniature Landscape Hobbies, and in this episode, we're going to talk about how to build some custom terrain to celebrate the launch of Flames of War's new supplement, North Africa Mid-War Forces. In the first episode in this series, we took the excellent Ruined Desert Houses and Large Desert Houses by Gale Force 9 and prepared them for the North African terrain. And the results, I think, were great. But you know me, I don't really like to produce any terrain that doesn't have a really custom feel. So I decided that I needed to build a couple pieces of scattered terrain that would up the ante and just evoke the imagery of North Africa that much more. I also like to incorporate details of my travels into my terrain to give it a bit of a backstory. And it just happens that before the lockdowns, my family went on a trip to Morocco, and we spent some time camping in the desert. Because of this, there are two things I want to include in this build. One was this building. Okay, it was the camp bathroom but I like it, primarily because I had food poisoning at the time, and I spent a lot of time in there. The bathroom was really nice, though, fortunately. The second was this guy, Hayu the Camel. Let's face it, most camels really are kind of gross, but this guy was really great, always coming into the camp to hang out with us, so... A while back, I painted a 3D printed version of him, and the model needs a home. This project would be perfect for that. So let's get down to work on the custom North African terrain. To start with, I decided this terrain would also have some rock walls and a well. It would all go on two bases. I 3D printed the walls, I found the file on Thingiverse, then I laid these out on a piece of cardboard. Drawing around the walls, I got a basic shape for each base. Using this mark as a guide, I then cut the base out. For each of the two bases I made, I actually cut out two different layers. The bottom layer was slightly wider than the top layer. With this all then cut out, I then hot glued the layers together so I now had two bases. Taking out some masking tape, I went around the edges to smooth off the gradients between the two layers of cardboard and to seal in the edges. Now I was ready to begin work on the well and the building. Also at this point, I decided that the building as it was actually built was just a little too square and boring. So I did modify the construction a bit. But don't worry, in my mind, it's the same bathroom. I took out some half inch pink styrofoam and I measured out a three by three centimeter block on one side and a rough circle on the other that would eventually form the well. Taking these, I went to my hot foam cutter. I cut out the block first and then cut out several more that were identical to it. I glued all these together, and then setting up the foam cutter to cut on an angle, I cut the top section off as a wedge. This would create a more interesting roof line than if it was just flat. Then for the well, I took my roughly circular or semicircular piece of styrofoam and threw it on the circle cutting tool for my hot foam cutter. Now, it was a long time before I actually realized what this is, but this little platform is designed for cutting circular pieces of foam. So using a pen, I went back to the well and the building, and I scored some stonework into them. Just lightly pressing pressure into the surface of the styrofoam, I could make lines that implied the seams and edges of the rocks. I then got out a bunch of matchsticks 
and glued them on to imply timber and supports on the outside of the building and also onto the well to create a cross piece for hauling the bucket up. To cap off the construction of the well in the building, I took out some matte Mod Podge, mixed it with some dark brown paint, and went ahead and heavily painted that over both of the structures. This would seal the styrofoam and protect it in the upcoming construction steps and lend extra structure to it. Now it was time for me to move on to the walls. I mounted the resin prints of the walls for painting and then went ahead and primed it all leather brown. Once the primers were dry, I then took out Iraqi sand and gave a heavy dry brush to everything, the walls, the building, and the well. I followed up with a quick dry brush of off-white. When all of this was dry, I then took out some Army Painter Dark Tone and washed it over top of everything to provide some relief and some shadows. Most of the structures were now looking really good, but they didn't look like they had been sitting out in the elements in the desert or that they had been lived in. So I got out my weathering pencils and I got to work applying them to the building. I used various colors, mainly concrete marks, sand, a little bit of medium rust, and orange. I worked them into the stone where I figured the wear and tear would apply, and then I carefully blended them out with a moist square tipped brush. This would keep the look very subtle, but would make it look like there was an interesting variety of colors and textures in the rocks of the buildings and the walls themselves. Returning to my bases, I take the wall sections, the well and the building, and I glue them back down. When I have them in place, I get out my masking tape again, and this time I go around each of the parts I just added. I want to mask them off because the next steps will be pretty messy and I don't want to get paint and glue on them. To lay down the grit, I start by taking some Mod Podge that's mixed with dark brown paint and I spread it over each of the bases. When I've got this laid down, I then grab some sand and a little bit of kitty litter and I sprinkle it down over top of the Mod Podge. I let that sit on top, but before it dries, I put it flat on a surface and I start to wet it with some rubbing alcohol and I apply it over top with a pipette. On top of this, while it's still all soaking wet, I then go back with the original mixture of Mod Podge, water it down just a little more, and then apply it on top with a pipette as well. Now the grid is all fastened down, but it's going to need some time to dry so I leave it overnight. It's now the next morning and everything has dried nicely, so it's time to get down to work painting the base. I start with a dry brush of tan. Once I've dry brushed that on over top, I then move to a dry brush of off-white. I keep this one intentionally very light so that it doesn't overpower the base and make it look like it's covered in snow. Also, we've spent a lot of time building a lot of natural colors and textures by gluing down the sand and tinting it with the previous layers of glue and ink, so I want these to show through to create a realistic effect. When this paint has dried, I'm now ready to remove the masking tape. I go in and pull it off, revealing all the work I've done previously. This is a pretty rewarding part because it's not a lot of fun to do a lot of custom work with lots of interesting colors and then just immediately and go and cover it up before you enjoy it. After the dry brushing, often things lose a little bit of their definition. So I get out some dark brown ink, in this case smoky ink, and I go in with a brush and just pick out some of the details. I trace around the walls, the rocks, and anywhere that where I think I need the shadows need to be accentuated. I follow up by gluing down some small features with super glue. 
I used some crates, tables, and other different things you would expect to find around a camp. I pre-paint a batch of these ahead of time, so they're all ready to go. They help establish a sense of scale for the model and make it look like the area is actually lived in and being used. Plus, it just ups the visual interest for the casual viewer. Now comes time to add the vegetation effects, and I decided to go fairly light on this. Now, the desert really isn't just entirely open sand. It does have quite a lot of growth, and when I was on my vacation there, there really was a surprising amount of greenery. I didn't want to overdo it though, so I went ahead and did a sparse layer of yellow static grass here and there, and then followed up with a limited number of grass clumps. And now, finally, I could add Hayu the camel, and a couple of his friends. When this was done, the model was pretty much ready. All it needed was a couple coats of matte varnish to protect it from wear and tear of regular gaming. And with that, this project was done. I now had two new pieces of terrain, a desert oasis, and a campsite. They were in an appropriate scale for Flames of War, and there are plenty of little details to hold the viewer's interest. These details will establish scale and suggest a story element, while at the same time making room for tanks and infantry stands. When I combine this with the Desert Houses for Flames of War featured in my first video in this series, and put all this on my new desert battle mat, it'll all come together to make a convincing miniature spread in which to play my mid-war battles for the launch of North Africa mid-war forces. I can hardly wait to get to work and play some games. Now all I need are some more mid-war era appropriate tanks. Oh yeah, and some of the new mid-war monsters. That's it for this episode. I hope you enjoyed watching it as much as I enjoyed making it. Please remember to like and subscribe my videos, and if you'd like to support Miniature Landscape Hobbies, check out the link to my Patreon in the video description. Thanks for watching. We'll be back soon with some more videos on wargaming, terrain building, and dioramas. Until next time, remember to keep building life in miniature.